Uh, thanks everybody for being here. My name is Nathan White. I'm going to be moderating this panel. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm playing a character named Patrick Bateman from a m movie called American Psycho, which I'm, I'm finding is not nearly as popular as I thought that movie was. Uh, getting a lot of strange looks, but I, I don't know how long I'm going to be able to rock two jackets in Atlanta summer anyway, so I, it may not last throughout this entire panel. Uh, as I said, my name is Nathan White. I work for an organization called Access Now, which is an international NGO that focuses on users' uh, rights and digital rights around the world. Uh, I've been working on the issue of network neutrality pretty substantially since 2010. And when I first started getting involved in it, I was thinking, you know, this is going to be an easy one. It's, it's just so popular and it's so common sense. We're, we're just going to have to win this battle and then we'll just move on and, and, and go to the next thing. Uh, and here I am, uh, almost a decade later, still talking about it. And usually when I'm on panels with people, they can say they've been going for even longer than I have. So having been doing this for 10 years and talking about this subject, I've learned it's really hard to have a debate about net neutrality anymore simply because it's overwhelmingly people support net neutrality. The, co the question is, do you know what it is? It's a really boring sounding word, but generally once you learn about it, people support the concept. Uh, it's one of those things in politics that is almost a victim of its own success. It's so wildly popular that no one wants to do it because they can't get anything for doing it. On the flip side, there's also very wealthy industry that's been putting a lot of money into this debate for a very long time. So rather than attempt to have a debate over net neutrality this year where one side pretends to argue in favor of net neutrality and one side I hate to argue net neutrality. It, we made uh, Nathan be the bad guy last year. <laughs> Let, last year I did my best impression of a of a corporate lobbyist and it, and it was quite fun. <laughs> but, or an American psycho. Or an American psycho. Ha. Huh? <laughs> Bazing. Uh, I think he was a banker though. Um, Rather than try to do that again this year, it seems like people have a sense of what the issues are and what's at stake, but a lot has been happening in the last year, and a lot of it's really wonky. So instead of having a debate, what I've asked my fellow panelists to do is to pre present in five or so minutes, ten minutes if it runs long, on various aspects of the debate and what's been moving in the last six months to a year to try to give everybody a sense in the room of, at the end of an hour, Hopefully we'll all be experts on not only net neutrality as a policy, but where things are in the net neutrality fight, which has been going on, uh, as, as we'll learn, really since 1956. Uh, stealing your thunder there. Uh, but first, just to yeah. get a sense of the room, is there anybody who's never heard of net neutrality in the room? It would be weird if you walked into a room and didn't at least know what the title was. Is there anybody here who knows what net neutrality is and thinks it's a really bad idea? Is Don't there, be afraid. Is there anybody here who has been who knows what the Federal Communications Commission is? Hey, lots of hands. Is there anybody in the room who has taken an action in the last year or two years to the FCC or your member of Congress? Right. So most of the people in the room have some familiarity with the concept. So we're going to start with a little bit of a background for those of us who haven't been working on this for 10 years. And then we're going to talk about where things, uh, it, where the fight is at the state level, at the federal level, and in the courts, at the international level. And then we're going to hold some time for discussion and questions and, and really make sure that everybody is learning and hearing what they want to talk about. And then if they have uh, direct stories that they want to share as well. So we're going to start by introducing ourselves. I hate it when a moderator just reads somebody's bio. You can always Google somebody while they're talking if they say something interesting. So we're going to start by going down the row and just very quickly introducing ourselves. And then Ketech is going to start with a history of net neutrality through the uh, repeal of the FCC. But before we do that, let's go my left to right and just do quick introductions. So how, how deep are we going in this introduction? So just name and... Uh, Name, rank, and serial number. I mean, you got 60 seconds. You want my social number? Um, so, no, I'm, I'm national. I work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I'm the grassroots advocacy organizer. So a lot of my work is working with um, local, or, local organizations in 26 states and helping them to push for advocacy and, and information sharing, skill sharing within their communities. I'm Gatech. I uh, work for a site, uh, site called torrentfreak.com, uh, which is a new site focusing mainly on peer-to-peer -peer systems like BitTorrent um, and similar things. Um, I've been there for 
almost 12 years now as a lead researcher. So, um, and, and that'll become apparent as to, to why it's, it's relevant in a, in a few moments. But uh, yeah, I've been, I've been covering the net neutrality thing for about 11 and a half years. So. Uh, I'm Meredith Rose. I'm a policy counsel of public knowledge, which is a consumer advocacy group in Washington, D.C. Uh, we do a whole host of things. Net neutrality is one of them. We've been involved in this fight for a very long time, um, since pre-2010 rules. Uh, yeah, we've been, we've been arguing about this one for a long time. My name is T.J. Myhill. I, I don't have a cool sounding organization. I'm just a partner at a law firm here in Atlanta, but uh, I deal with business and technology, uh, law and litigation. Uh, internet is a big part of that, and so here I am. Okay, so the history. As somebody stole my thunder, I was going to say, a lot of the net neutrality people think started 2015, say, but the, the, the very basics of, of what net neutrality is based on it comes all the way back to 1956 with a device called the Hushaphone. Uh, anybody heard of Hushaphone? Uh, as you, uh, for those who don't, I mean, we have one or two that do, but it was a small device, like a, like a box that went over the front mouthpiece of a uh, handset, telephone handset, so that you could speak into it and it w wouldn't be heard by those around. And there was a lawsuit about it because the telephone company owned the phones and they didn't want people modifying their phones, things like that. And so it went to the Supreme Court and they said, yes, you can, mo you can mechanically attach to a phone. So there's, there's a device autonomy sort of thing. They can't interfere with how you use the device. And then fast forward uh, 12 years to 1968, um, a thing called Cardaphone, which is uh, a device which could link radios into it. And Again, another ruling was that you could put devices as, onto networks as long as they didn't interfere with the networks. That would basically give you the, the ability to put your own handsets onto, your own telephone handsets onto your telephone plugs at home. That came from the Carter phone decision in 1968. And that basically opened neutrality for the telephone network, uh, which later on through dial-up and DSL became really, really important because without Carter phone, you wouldn't be able to use modems. Without Husher phone, you couldn't drop them into a, the old acoustic coupler modems. And then later, Carter phone, you could plug in modems. So they became really important for the very early aspects of, of dial-up modems and the net neutrality for the early uh, internet, as we know it, rather than the web. So that, that, that happened, and, and, for, and for many, as most of you probably know, uh, the internet back then was under Title II. Title II of the FCC Act says that it's a communication service. The telephone system is a communication service, obviously. You talk, they talk back. It's a two-way street. But there's a Title I, which is an information system. And that's things like cable TV, where it's usually them providing information to you and you not really saying anything back. Um, so with, we had dial-up internet and we kept having it. I don't know how long any of you all had it. I had dial-up internet until 2002. Um, but it kept going. And then in 2002, in the States, uh, cable companies uh, wanted their connections because let me rephrase that. In 1996, we started getting cable modems. They started. Then the, the early DSLs. And before that, uh, ISDN systems, all things like that. So they started using telephone networks for higher speed connections than just dial-up, using specialist equipment. And then they say cable modems in 96. Cable companies didn't like the fact that their cable TVs were under Title I, but their cable modems were under Title II. So. They, they, they pushed and lobbied to try and have that changed. And in 2002, the FCC decided to uh, reclassify cable modems under Title I to go with the rest of the thing, kind of for everything a cable company does is now Title I, rather than everything grouped by the task, by, the, by what they do. So that then went to a Supreme Court, what's Supreme Court, right? Yeah. yeah. Called Brand X. And then the Brand X verdict said that, yes, you could reclassify it as long as there's compelling evidence and there's, there's, th there's things. And we talked about the administrative, um, was it nationally? Yeah, it, that's it. Yeah, we talked about that some last time, so we come to it. And, and that'll become more apparent in a few minutes. But they said basically, yes, you can reclassify. So in 2005, 
the FCC reclassified both telephone-based and cable uh, company-based ISPs from Title II to Title I, which Pai does not want you to know because that undermines his biggest talking point ever. That just 11, uh, 13 years ago, that's when they reclassified from Title II to Title I. So that goes on, and with that, they then the FCC then puts out a document. It's, it's um, a three-page document. It's, it's, it's numbered 05-151, which means the 151st document in 2005. And it basically makes a statement that with this reclassification, we are providing that a series of four bullet points of net neutrality principles that all things should be should be under. And said so this is 2005 that the FCC puts this out. Fast forward to 2007, and what I'm working for, Torrent Freak, um, we get a report or two that some people on Comcast are having problems with BitTorrent connections. And they're all coming from Comcast and are scattered around the country. So they set me to investigate it, and uh, talking with some of the network researchers, we find that we're getting odd RST or reset packets sent through. So. I, I scour things, I, I message all my friends, all the people I know, and say, can you um, investigate this, see what you think, and then I'll set up a BitTorrent client, and we'll, we'll do this, and we'll sh set up uh, packet captures, uh, Wireshark things, and so I get these. We do that, and I get these huge text files. I mean, it takes me days to go through each one, mark them all out, and it turns out that, yeah, there's packet captures, there's reset packets that are being received that haven't been sent. And it's only happening with Comcast customers. So we did a little more investigating, a, lot, a few more attempts at, at trials, and then it only happens in certain circumstances. So we write it up as a, a thing, and it turns out Comcast had just bought some technology a company called Sandvine. They put it in their things. When a um, BitTorrent connection is detected, and it they'd set it to, to when it went to seeding, or fully completed downloading, they would have this box inject RST packets, but it would do it in a way of a man in the middle attack. So if you two are talking, for instance, back and forth, this box in the middle, Sandvine, would say, say, hey, she said go away, stop talking to me. And hey, he said go away, stop talking to him. And so they'd each think that the other had said, to go in, stop talking, but neither had, that was all me, the man in the middle. That's the RST packet, so it was, it was terminating connections by um, pretending it was the other side to, to, to drop it. Um, and we published this, and Comcast denied, and denied, and denied, and then we got hold of a uh, internal document that said, yeah, we're doing this, but deny, deny, deny. And then when they found, we published, they said, find out who leaked this and fire, fire, fire. And then uh, a month or two later, the EFF um, did some research and, and double-checked it, and then the Associated Press also did their own independent test using the Bible. I can't remember what the EFF used. Do you remember? I don't. Um, but they did that in, in uh, October and November of 2007, and that got a little more thing because we're just one Dutch-based English language publication focused on BitTorrent. Of course, we're going to say ISPs are screwing with BitTorrent. That's what we do. But when you start getting the Associated Press and the FF getting behind it with their own independent test and thinking, damn, he may be, they're, they're right. We can't kind of sweep this away. And that caused the FCC to open an investigation into Comcast, which they did in 2008. So in 2008, they started investigating. They held some hearings, and Comcast decided to deny, deny, deny in the best way they know how, which is to go to hearings and basically hire people to take up all the spaces in the line so every, pretty much everybody in the, in the hearings uh, were seat warmers. So nobody who had a vested interest there so they could feign disinterest at progress and kind of block any activists from getting in and speaking to the, the thing. And that didn't go down too well with the FCC either when that, we broke that story that they had seat warmers. They, Comcast really hates us. Um, You're doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we did all this, and in the end, 
towards the end of 2008, Comcast and the FCC come to an arrangement. They'd stop messing around with BitTorrent and they'd pay $16 million in fines. And then as a condition for the merger with NBC, they would enact net neutrality restrictions of their own independent of anything else, but that's as a condition of the merger. Those conditions expired, I think, at the start of this year. So, um, in response, in response to that that thing, um, some companies said, telecom companies and things said, no, you don't have the rights to make these um, investigations and do this this thing to Comcast to the FCC, and so they sued. And in 2010, the DC Appeals Court said, yeah, they're right because you reclassified the Title One, you don't have the authority anymore to 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 impose this sort of thing. So, as you did in this, that 05-151 document that you, I, I mentioned earlier, you don't have the grounds for this. So they went away and they said, huh, okay. Three months later, they came back with a, a, a new system called the Open Internet Order, and that was based on a different section of Title I. And they said, okay, well, here's the new rules then. Same basic thing, different justification and basis for how we're gonna go about it. And they said, and Verizon said, no. Comcast said, Verizon said, no, we're not going to do it, and they sued. And then in 2014, the DC Appeals Court said, you know, we told you last time you couldn't do it under Title I. Doesn't matter which sex you do, you can't do it. If you want to do it, do a Title II. Denied, thrown out. So they go away, and that's when many, this is about the point many of you have heard about it, 2015, when they tried to um, change, they decided to go to, um, Title II and reclassified, it was floated and it wasn't the head of the time and his name escapes me right this second. Wheeler. Wheeler? No, yeah, Wheeler. Tom Wheeler, head, former head of the cable industry lobbying group, um, floated it and said, we'll think about it. And then um, my fellow countryman, John Oliver, um, got behind it and said, uh, any kids here? What kind of language can we use, Scott? What kind of language can we use? Can I quote him directly? <laughs> <laughs> hey, basically he said, <laughs> a story of net neutrality is so boring, it'll put you to sleep. Look, we talk about this, the Administrative Procedures Act. Like, so he said, let's put it simply, the whole topic is end cable company fuckery. And that galvanized people, when you put it in that, that kind of terms, net neutrality, end cable company fuckery, yeah. So it then, it then um, thousands of comments, hundreds of thousands of comments, and... In the end, they changed the rules in 2015. How far is that? Is that when we get to where I hand over to somebody else and I stop talking? Uh, no, I can, you're supposed to go another two years. But <laughs> I, can, I can hop on that one. Okay. Um, so one thing to keep in mind, we talk about Title I and Title II. Uh, so keep in mind the Communications Act, uh, that it was the sort of statute that the FCC operates under, where it gets its authority. And then the Telecommunications Act of 1996, uh, so go, we went from 1934 to 1996, for one thing, without majorly revising this law, so let that sink in for a bit. Um, gives basically, there's a bunch of different titles, and different kinds of services are classified under different titles, as you can probably tell. Um, the difference between Title I and Title II is the size of the toolbox that the FCC can bring to bear on people. Uh, Title I is extremely limited. There is not a lot that the FCC is authorized to do to Title I services. Uh, they can essentially go, hmm, and that's kind of about the end of it. Uh, Title II allows them to do, uh, you know, they can impose <coughs> reasonable measures. They can, they can, up to and including things like rate regulation, which is kind of like the boogeyman. When a lot of conservative Republicans saw this, they were like, you know, if you hear utility style regulation, they're talking about Title II because Title II is a huge friggin' toolbox. Now, when they reclassified as Title II in 2015, the order specifically said, look, we hereby forego our ability to do things like setting rates. Uh, we hereby forego our ability to do this laundry list of super controversial stuff that is pissing off a lot of Republicans and, and giving people aneurysms. Um, but we do retain the ability to enforce certain guidelines about what companies can and cannot do in terms of privileging content. Um, so that's the 2015 order. Uh, it was hugely popular. The election happened. Uh, Ajit Pai, who was up until then he was a commissioner, uh, became the chairman of the FCC and very promptly went about undoing these regulations under the delightfully titled Restoring Internet Freedom Order. 
uh, because reasons. Um, and this is where things kind of got interesting. Uh, so I'm a lawyer, and we look at. I come from a telecom regulatory background, so I am up to my eyeballs in the nuances of admin law and how courts think and like what agencies can and cannot do. So for the purposes of this talk, what you really need to know is agencies generally have a decent amount of leeway as far as the courts are concerned if they want to just reverse their position. If they just say, look, the last guy was wrong. Here are our reasons. Things have changed. Uh, you know, you want to have agencies be nimble enough that they're not like locked in by decisions they made 20, 30 years ago. Um, so agencies should have the ability to turn around at some point. Um, and so they get a decent amount of leeway for that as long as you can prove, like, conditions on the ground have changed. Okay, for one thing, not a lot changed in the span of, of 24 calendar months between the 2015 order and the 2017 repeal. As opposed to the 2005 and the 2015. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so the interesting thing between the 2005 and the 2015, and, and the 2010, actually, the 2010 was interesting because the 2010 was sort of like bite two with the title on Apple when they're like, okay, well, you told us we couldn't do it last time. So here's a slightly but, different recipe. It, it, this is all the background session? This is all the background session. Yeah, we, we, let's, let's get to the what's going on quickly today. Okay, so <laughs> I can geek out about this for a long time in case you couldn't tell. Um, so the short version is uh, they're getting sued. Uh, they got sued for the 2015 order. That lawsuit is still going on. Uh, <laughs> it is currently on petition before the Supreme Court. This is over the... the, the Pro net neutrality rules of 2015. Those the Supreme Court still is deciding whether or not it wants to hear a challenge to those. But it did. It did manage, it did manage the DC court. It did get. It managed to get through the DC Circuit, which is a big deal because um, the DC Circuit is generally pretty hostile to us. Um, and so that's on petition before the Supreme Court. The repeal order is also currently being challenged before the DC circuit. Um, public knowledge is a plaintiff in that case, so I'm a little bit constrained in kind of like how I can talk about it. Um, but a couple of things, and this is why I was started down on this tangent, a couple of weird things happened with the repeal order. One is they really, really overreached in their reasoning. They said, not only have things not changed, we were wrong, nothing has really changed, and in fact, we've never had any authority to to do with anything at broadband. We've never, ever, 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 ever been able to touch broadband. Which is Which, odd when, when you think that the Brand X decision said, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Um, yeah, so no one's believing that. Uh, and two, one of the things, and this is important to kind of what TJ is going to talk about, is that generally uh, the United States, there's this concept called preemption, which is essentially if uh, states can pass a whole bunch of laws, they can, there's, they get some leeway for that. Uh, if the federal government comes in and passes a law basically covering the same topic within certain legal bounds, then the federal government trumps it and then states are like kind of no longer, basically once the federal government has stepped in to issue a law on this, states are preempted from passing their own laws about the same thing. Um, and so generally that means when the government doesn't have a regulation about something, states can jump in and regulate it. And so this is where you see state level net neutrality uh, challenges coming in. And the FCC, in their repeal order, attempted to say, well, we don't have any authority over it, and we also preempt all states from ever regulating this ever. <laughs> Which, again, <clears throat> um, <laughs> legally, that's it's just a word salad. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and the whole thing was just very sloppily drafted. English major personal beef. They really rushed this one. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where things stand right now. Uh, for anyone who's actually interested in following the case at the DC Circuit, uh, the petitioner briefs are in, the petitioner amicus briefs are in, so like our friends have their briefs in. The FCC is going to have to respond uh, in the next month or two. Uh, that's going to be a wild ride when we see it. Um, and then it's going to sort of roll from there, but it's going to be a little while before it actually sees like an oral argument or anything. So we just threw a bunch of names and dates and history and administrative procedures and rules at you, but what, what I really want you to know at this point is up until 2017, we've always kind of had net neutrality protections. The reasoning changed, the rationale changed, the codes changed, the law might have changed, but the internet infrastructure has always had net neutrality. For and, 62 years. Yep. And thanks to people like KTech, we figured out when cable companies were trying to mess with that and took them to court. What was big news in 2017 was for the first time, the cable companies kind of won. 
and they got the FCC to say, no, there is no federal leg legislation. That's going through the courts, and none of the companies have really acted on that because they don't really want to piss people off while it's going through the courts. But right now, for the last, what, year and a half, we actually don't have legal protections for net neutrality. No, just since June. So, yeah, right, just since yep. June, because they didn't actually go into effect until, until a year mm -hmm. after. Uh, so now we're in a place where, for the first time in the Internet's history, we're fighting different battles to get those protections back. Those battles are taking place in the courts, as Meredith and her organization are, are leading the fights on. Uh, they're also happening in Congress, and they're also happening at the state level. So the next thing that I want to get into is just try and have some explanations on where the status are on those individual fights. And I think we are going to gnash sure. for where the fight is in Congress. Yes, yes. And so, so as you mentioned, so the restoring internet freedom order uh, passed at the end of this, uh, at the end of December, which meant it, it started. Well, it started a clock, and how and how much time the FCC had to file. Their, to, to file in the Federal Register and to give Congress their report. Once that happened, it created an opportunity for, for con Congress members, senators, to move forward with something using, it's called the Congressional Review Act. And what the Congressional Review Act allows is for, the, for, mem for representatives to revisit or rescind an order that comes out of an administrative agency, so the FCC being an administrative agency. And to, and, to, and to do it in such a way that even if the Speaker of the House or the House, the House leadership didn't want to move forward, a majority of the members of that body could, could move forward and, and, have the, and potentially have that order rescinded. And so, that, so that, that time clock started on May 16th when the FCC finally filed, filed their report and, and published in the Federal Register. And so what that meant is the, we started with the, with the Senate and the Senate, and the Senate has already passed the, uh, the discharge position that would allow that would, the repeal of the 2017 Restoring Internet Freedom Order. Um, so it passed with a, at a vote of 52 to 47. And so now what needs to happen is for that, and it requires a joint resolution. So now that same process needs to go through in the House. Luckily, we have a little bit more time. There was a very specific clock on the Senate side. There's a little bit more time on the House side. We essentially have the, to the end of this, of this current session. And so right now we're sitting at about, we're, they're coming off of a break, so we'll really have a better idea next week as, as your members, as your representatives start to come in and to actually, they have to physically sign the discharge position. And, but we're, we need 218 votes in, on the Congress, on, on the House side, rather. Uh, right now we, we have about 177 confirmations. And once, so once that's, that's passed, we've already got it passed on the, on the Senate side, once the, the House side goes through their process as well, then it'll move forward and then we'll have to put that same pressure that we've been putting on, on senators and congressmen to really show that they're standing behind their constituents. Because mind you, even though when we look at the Senate side, it was overwhelmingly Democrats with a few independents and Republicans that signed on, it, 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 was, it, it looked very partisan. But when you look at the actual, when constituency, 82% of Republicans support net neutrality. 90% of Democrats support net neutrality. 85% of independents support net neutrality. This is not a, this is not a, a partisan issue. The, the, Amer the people, the people that they're there to represent are overwhelmingly in support of rescinding that order. So now it's a matter of putting that pressure on those representatives and holding them accountable and making them go on the record and saying, are they actually standing with the people that they're there to represent? Or are they standing with the, with the, the powerful incumbent ISPs that are trying to continue the monopoly that they have on on, on, um, on the access to your home. Over 58% of us only have one option of broadband provider. So hopefully we'll be able to put that pressure on and raise that number from where it's at at 177 right now to the 218 that we need to, to, to have it move forward and, and also continue to put that pressure when it needs to go into the president's signature as well. And so one of the ways that you can, um, that you can make sure and see where your representative is, checkyourreps.org is a great site that you go on and see whether your representative has um, has committed to a position, has signed the discharge position, and where they, that they're standing. So you can take the appropriate actions to make sure that they know that you and your community are standing there um, and, and behind them and watching what they're doing and holding them accountable for what they do in that process. If you want to get involved, that is one area where we really need as much help as possible. If you're on any mailing list from any of the groups up here, you've probably heard us emailing you, asking you to take steps. And there are a lot of groups that are working on this. The, there have been specific communities that have been organized uh, to show their political support. For example, just recently there was a military service members for Net Neutrality Day, where military members called into their members of Congress and said, 
We use the internet to contact our loved ones when we're overseas. Don't mess with it. Small businesses, 7,000 small businesses across the country have signed letters and written in saying, we rely on this for our small business. Don't mess with it. Uh, countless constituencies, but more is needed. Uh, a couple more numbers while we're throwing out, out percentages. Uh, there was a recent survey in April that found, uh, what was the exact percent? 86% of registered voters support net neutrality and think it's important in this election. Uh, a more recent survey of four of the hottest battleground congressional districts found that over 60% of people said it would, was important and would influence their vote for Congress this session. Again, one of those things, there are people who don't support net neutrality, but it's really not an issue that people are arguing about whether or not it's a good thing. It's arguing whether or not the rules should stand and where they should exist. Uh, so that, that was Congress. We also have uh, challenges at the state level. And for that, I think we're going to go to TJ. Yep. So <clears throat> once the federal government got rid of net neutrality, states decided to take some action. And in the intervening months, we're up to now 39, 37, 39, 39 states have taken some action to enforce net neutrality at a state level or attempt to enforce net neutrality at a state level. A handful of those have done that through executive order. The governor has come in and said, if you're going to do business with the state or using state utilities, you're going to uh, comply with specific net neutrality rules, 2015 rules, whatever rules they want to put in. So that's one aspect, that's one way that's been handled. Now, the, the, the risk to executive orders is that those can always be overturned by the next governor. So most of the other states are dealing with some form of legislative action. The downside to any legislative action at any level is, as you can hear from the talk we've had up here about how this legislation has gone, it's, it's a slow process. So while all of these states have proposed some action, the majority of these states, the majority of the 39 states have legislation pending. Whether it passes or not is still unknown. So there is some action being taken, but it's the treadmill action right now. We, we've only got a few states where it has actually gotten through the legislative process. And unfortunately, in several of those, it didn't pass. So it, 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 was, it, was, it was not approved by the, by the legislature. So that is, a, that is a risk for the remaining pending le legislation as well. It may pass the majority of states. It may not. Um, but that is a, a state-level response to the lack of any type of, of federal net neutrality. That's not an ideal solution because, of course, that's great if California passes net neutrality and you live in California, but what happens if you live in North Dakota and North Dakota doesn't pass a net neutrality statute? Your neighbor in California has, you know, great internet and you're still stuck with North Dakota internet. So it's, it's a state-by-state state solution isn't a great solution, but it's the one we have now. And the nice thing is that, that a majority of states are trying to take some action. As Meredith said, though, all of that action is arguably preempted by the ruling by the FCC because they've determined that the states can't do this. It, 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 is, it is against the rules. So all of these state efforts, even if they do ultimately pass, or the majority of these legislative efforts do pass, could be trumped by the federal level lack of rule uh, preempting any rule they try to impose. That's also a win, to be perfectly honest, because to get to that point, someone's going to have to bring suit and say, hey, California, you can't have that rule. Hey, Georgia, hey, New York, whoever, you can't have that rule. We're going to, we're going to bring this to court and say that your, your, your statute has to be uh, removed because it's, it's preempted by the federal decision. And that just means another courtroom and another hearing and another opportunity to discuss this net neutrality at the federal level, whether that preemption is allowable when you're somehow arguing that we can preempt you but take no effort on anything else. But also on the, on the can we do anything else or have we anything uh, power over anything else. So the more this gets in the courtroom, <coughs> the, 
really the better. So even, <clears throat> even though this action at the state level is arguably preempted, that preemption is as big a risk for the for the for the current lack of net neutrality as the as the legislative effort is. Uh, TJ, I'm sure you've been on the road, but are you, have you seen what recently just happened in California? No, actually, I haven't. Uh, so the House and the Senate, the Senate just yesterday uh, passed their net neutrality bills yeah. in California. There you go. Uh, and are on their way to the governor's office. No longer pending. Woo! -hoo. That's good. I hadn't heard that either. Out it, of pending it, it's fantastic news. You may have heard at one point uh, that the legislature had gutted the strength of the net neutrality rules and before it was moving forward. There was such an uprising, they actually put it back in. So these are the good rules. These are based on the 2015 federal protections. I'm sure this will end up in court, but California is not a bad place for us to be having this fight. Right. Uh, see, question, a couple other just quick things. Um, we throw one out the thing to know is that the, the corporations, the one thing they hate more than a bad federal rule is uh, 50 state rules that they have to deal with, especially if you're dealing with a network of the internet. If I send an email to somebody in California, it's virtually impossible to have three different networks with three different rules across the way. So they are terrified of state rules to the point where they have really pulled out all the stops in California. Uh, it, it was reported last week that I think it was Comcast was uh, sending robocalls to seniors mm -hmm. saying if net neutrality passed, it means your your bill will go up $30. But not referring to net neutrality, just saying the name of the bill, right. this will make your bill, your phone go up $30, <laughs> just to scare them. Yeah. Uh, the Los Angeles newspaper editorial just yesterday uh, blasted them for that, that it was totally misleading. But they are doing everything that they can to stop this. One good thing is, while that's working in the courts though, they will be forced to deal with it and be doing that battle and be having the different battles at different levels of state, which actually makes them a weird ally as we push for a federal permanent solution for things like if we can't repeal if the, the 2017 order, if we do have to ultimately get legislation through Congress to protect the open internet, then oddly, they would sort of support having a national standard. Right. We'd be fighting over what that standard is, but it helps us go to Congress and say, well, the FCC really screwed this up. We, we have to do something. Uh, and thankfully, because of the political support across the aisle, if we do get to that point, I will continue to be optimistic. Um, it, was there a question you wanted to jump in on something there? Uh, I think we need the, hang on, I think we need Mike. No. Oh. Yeah, we got the we got the oh. box somewhere. Also, just quickly piggyback on this, the 2010 rules uh, were kind of weak sauce because they were posted under Title One. This was bite number two with the Title One Apple. Uh, and Verizon said like, "No, we object." And literally every other ISP was like, "Shut up, shut up, shut up," <laughs> um, because it was very questionable whether the FCC the FCC wouldn't have really been able to bring anything to bear. Uh, and Verizon was like, "No, on principle, we don't support this." And then the DC Circuit sent out an opinion that said. Hey, FCC, if you need to do this, try Title II. <laughs> told uh, you last time. Yeah, and this is how you do it, just saying. Uh, so. I draw you a picture. Uh, didn't Ajit Pai work for Verizon at one point? Yeah. Yes. He was the <laughs> corporate counsel <laughs> in, mm -hmm. I think, 2003. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder how that happened. Shockingly. <laughs> he then went from there to work for a prison phone company, which, and surprisingly enough, he had the same kind of uh, impact and, and views on uh, telephone um, call charges for prisons as he has on net neutrality, which is, <laughs> hey, I used to work in that company. What they do is great. I'm going to give them everything they want. Yeah, prison phones is a whole separate depressing mm -hmm. issue. So. <laughs> so while we're talking about Ajit Pai, there's, there's two things I'd like to say. Uh, first, well, let me start by saying there is another side to the net neutrality debate. There are people who think net neutrality is not fair on the telecoms. There are people who say Verizon and Comcast are in the same business world competing with Facebook, Google, and Apple. And if they have stockholders that want them to make money for the, their stockholders, they need to be able to do whatever they need to do. If people are willing to pay for a product, they should be allowed to offer that service. There are a lot of people who make that point and believe that point. And some of them work for Ajit Pai, and I actually like a couple of them. They're good people. I'm saying that to preempt, the, to say, before I say the fact that 
Ajit Pai has not been honest with the American people during this process. No. After the repeal went into place, they wrote into the rule very confusingly that the rule, the repeal rule would not take effect until 60 days after OMB certified the rules, which is just a weird way of saying this will not take effect until the White House says it's okay for this to take effect. That didn't happen for an entire year. It didn't happen until June. During that entire time where Ajit Pai wrote a law or wrote a rule saying this will not take effect yet, went around the country saying, the internet still works, it's not broken, see, it's fine, knowing full well that the rule hadn't even taken effect yet. That was just academically dishonest, and every time he said that, it just ruined his credibility. Another uh, credibility ruin, ruining problem, uh, you might have recently heard about an Office of Inspector General report. Mm -hmm. After one of the times that John Oliver talked about <laughs> net neutrality on his now HBO show, uh, a lot of people called in to the FCC to comment. So many people commented that their web system crashed. How many here? Yeah, how many people yeah, here? Who, Did here who here wrote in comments or calls? Woo! Thank you. We're clapping for you. Yeah, no, I wrote my comments about the. I did it the Wednesday before con. I spent the entire day doing 37 pages. I didn't go to sleep because I then had to pack for here. So if everybody remembers my zombie-like state from last year, <laughs> that was one of the reasons why. So the web system crashed, and the IT person said, oh, there was a, a DDoS attack. Somebody was trying to shut down our networks. <laughs> so a, a year later, uh, that IT person has moved on. He no longer works for the FCC. Uh, but an inspector general did a report and found that was never true. There was never a DDoS attack. It was an old system that failed because people were actually trying to make their comments because they really do care about this wonky subject. What's shocking, though, is that for an entire year, that IT person and Ajit Pai were behind the scenes trying to convince people, yes, it did happen. They were calling journalists, putting out stories, and I'm not going to say that they lied, but uh -oh. I think you could probably <laughs> infer that they were lying. <laughs> I was going to say, Ben, don't finish. <laughs> uh, there's one more element to the net neutrality de debate that I want to bring in before we open up for any questions that, that people might have. And that is, you might have noticed, we've been talking entirely about the United States, and the World Wide Web is global. The United States is not the only place where this debate is taking place and where people care about the open internet. You might be shocked to know. Uh, but what you might not be surprised about is the United States has incredible influence in the terms of telecom. Uh, we, as a nation, built most of the telecom networks. Even the fiber optic cables that run between countries, a lot of the hubs that control them still come through the United States and are still hosted here. It's one of the things that makes it really, really easy for us to spy on the internet and one of the reasons we're really afraid of the Chinese building infrastructure to compete with us. Because we built so much of the internet and because we have hundreds of years of rules and laws about telecom, we are wildly influential in other countries on this. For a long time, most people just mimicked whatever the US rules were. That started to get confusing for other telecom regulators beginning in about 2005 when we started going back and forth. They said, okay, we're gonna follow the US. Well, what is the US? Are, what, are, what are they doing? It's, it's confusing. So around 2005, 2010, other countries started looking at this and kind of followed the United States throughout the debate of, should there be net neutrality protections? If so, how should they be enshrined? 2015 was the major year when the United States finally said, we're gonna reclassify Title II, this is what it's gonna be, we're done. Uh, it was also a major year in the European Union and in India and in South America, where regulators independently came to the same conclusion. And this was interesting and rare in that it wasn't, we're coming to this conclusion because it's what the Americans do when we're copying them. It was actually, well, we've done our own process. We've, con we've talked to our own networks. We've talked to our own people. And we think this is the right way to do it. So since around 2015, the rest of the world, for the most part, considers this a closed debate. The debate is, how do you enforce it? At the European Union, they have European Union level rules but said the nations are supposed to enforce them. Most of the nations haven't really written rules to enforce them yet. So there's pressure to get the states to actually go through it. In India, they have some of the strongest net neutrality protections, and they've repeatedly said, we are going to do this. We're actually gonna hold companies accountable. 
And so the, a lot of the rest of the world is looking at over us like, R really? We, we thought this was done, we're moving forward. And what's interesting here is that they're not reconsidering because the United States is reconsidering. This is a done conversation. They've gone through this process. And so I think it would take a long time for us to really see this play out. But something we're seeing as an international organization is that America's losing some credibility here of going back and forth and not being honest about the process and going through the court. Other countries just don't want to follow our lead anymore. They're willing to go it on their own and make decisions that make sense for them. And now there's a lot of other companies around the world who are selling the network equipment to build big, big networks. They don't rely on AT&T the same way that they used to. Uh, so the status for the international level is, is really, this is, this is done. This is a silly conversation and they're not having this anymore. So that is our overview of where the battle over net neutrality stands. Before we open it up to the audience, does anybody on the panel think we missed anything or want to bring anything up? Or this, this could be like a four-hour lecture series. Right. Does anybody want to relitigate so. the 1996 <laughs> decisions? So hush your phone. Um, no, we should go open it up to questions. Let's go. Okay, are there any questions from the audience? Okay. Oh, that box. He's got it. He's got it, but it's just not up. There we go. Uh, you talked quite a bit about how there's you know state by state and nation by nation rules in place, and I'm curious about the jurisdictional issue. If I'm physically sitting at a terminal in California and hitting a DNS server in Germany to access a website that's in Australia, do all the laws of all those different places come into play? Is it about where the different devices sit? Is it about where the end user is sitting? Whose rules? are preeminent in this, if any, in this process? Well, most of the state rules that they're currently trying to go through are, are specific to the state that you're in. I mean, I think we can only govern our own citizens, but also uh, they specifically relate to the use of the utility system or the governmental systems in that state. The, the, the majority of the, of the rules that I've seen have some basis in if you're going to use our infrastructure you're going to follow these old rules we thought were much better so for for the state by state situation it really is a state governed uh, it, it's a state law to govern state citizens and those corporate citizens in that state providing services through that state's infrastructure the short version it's a mess yeah um, it, and it's going to get a bigger mess the longer this goes on. The, yeah. the internet used to be a small eye because an internet was something that you would host among your networks and your computers. Then the internet used to have a capital I because it was a network of networks that nobody owned the internet. Everybody in this room might be a network in the world. And the way it works is if I want to send a message to Australia in the back of the room, I don't have to determine how to get it there. I just need to hand it to somebody who knows, okay, I can look at this, it's going that way. Oh, that way's slow, I'm gonna hand it this way. And everybody follows the same rules. The net neutrality concept is don't interfere with the packets. Don't care what they are, don't open them, just passing them along to the next person. If we have rules that allow somebody, you know, to own this half of the room, and they say, no, we're not gonna pass packets unless you pay us. Well, then the rest of the internet might go around them. Some people are gonna go through them because it's still faster. Some people are gonna pay them. Some people are gonna use it as a content delivery network to say, well, you are close to my customers, so I need you to deliver these packets, so we're gonna pay you. But it, it really is gonna be a mess. And if you have those different jurisdictions and different rules, you're gonna have a whole bunch of different networks, follow, uh, parts of the networks following different rules and it doesn't take very long to think that kind of breaks down the internet as we know and understand it as a global thing. Yeah. In the back. Any other questions? Um, my question's more on the marketing and like political strategy side of things. You guys had mentioned like making a simple catchphrase was easier than trying to talk about net neutrality. Is there a Frank Lutz for us on our side? If you guys are not familiar with Frank Lutz, mm. he's the psychology guy on the right who came up with Clean Air Act and things like that on how to easily appeal to people because just based on some of the stuff you said, my background's in psychology, there's so much that's easily pullable, something like uh, corporations over self-governance. 
emphasis on self. That thing can catch like fire. Is there a, like an organization or a person we could sort of uh, reach out to that's on the strategy side? Yeah, so th this is one area where we, we really have failed, that everyone agrees net neutrality is a terrible term. Uh, it was started by a guy named Tim Wu, who's, who's in New York, and even he didn't intend it to be this term that we all talk about and fight about. But the problem really is, is that this fight has been going on so long that there's no other terms that have that same knowledge base, that even though it is such a weird term and it's so hard to explain to people, if you start something else, you're starting over from scratch. And so there have been a lot of, there have been several people over the years who have agreed and said, yeah, this is a really stupid way to talk about it. You're not helping yourself. And some smart people have done this. I, I know there's a few different groups who have even paid consultants to say, what are better ways that we should talk about this? And surveys show when you go out and you pull people, there are better ways to talk about this, but then we all default back to net neutrality because it's what people know. Right. And you're right, we're not good at it. And we might be losing because of that. And if you can change us, you will be the hero of the movement. Well, but the nice thing about that is, I mean, again, we're terrible marketing, but good product, right? The, the, the reality is that, as we've said, the majority of people do support net neutrality, even with bad branding. Uh, the, the, the 39 states are bipartisan states. The, the people, uh, you know, the, the, the polled voters are bipartisan voters. The people in general really do want the net neutrality. They're just not as effective at marketing that message as Comcast is and Verizon is. And part of that is lobbying funds and part of that is lobbying activity. Comcast and Verizon are really, really invested in this. And unfortunately, a lot of people aren't invested enough to take the effort to make their voice heard or make their voice known. And we can all be pro net neutrality all we want, but if no one hears us say it, then that's where we need to, to be more focused. So it's, it really is something that does, this, this is an area, I, I know this is an area, I say it at every single panel, but please, Call your representatives. Call your call your local representatives at the state level because we've got state action happening. Call your federal representatives and tell them they dropped the ball. Call anybody you can call. Write letters. Send emails. People need active. to know that this is something that will influence your vote. Yeah, is the thing. This is currently on Capitol Hill. The attitude is people care, but they're not going to swap their vote over it. Fun. That needs to change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fun fact: In addition to the 39 states that are considering state level legislation. 22 states plus the District of Columbia have joined the uh, the legal battle saying right. that they do not support the right. 2017 repeal and want the 2015 rules to come back. That's actually more than 50% of the population that live in those mm -hmm. states. So popular vote might yeah. win this one. Um, I, I'll also just kind of point out, and this is sort of looping back around more directly to your question. Um, you know, as someone who works on a, a lot of infrastructure policy, uh, this is a problem we have a lot. These are hugely important issues that are not terribly sexy. I mean, I can talk about prison phones and rural broadband and, and fucking attachment rules for cell towers all day, and it's hugely important stuff, and like literally no one cares. Um, Cable company fuckery. Gable company fuckery, always a great phrase. No, and what it like, and this is why John Oliver has been probably the best ambassador for the issue that we ever could have prayed for, is because you know I've talked to his research team on other issues before. They're phenomenal. Um, they absolutely do a huge amount of legwork. Um, but at the end of the day, you know the the opposing side, Comcast, can go out and say, "Don't let the government regulate the internet," and that's the messaging. It's it's crap messaging, it's totally disingenuous messaging, but it's sound bitey, and that's yeah. what they can get out in front of there. The response to that is, don't let Comcast regulate the internet. <laughs> like, for love of God, no one wants them, of all people, to be doing it. Um, but you're right, this is, like, this is a perennial problem from the public interest side. It is, it is a very complicated issue. It's super fucking in the weeds, as evidenced by the fact that we spent 50 minutes just talking about nothing but background. And we didn't Sorry. even get all the background. Um, and ate up the question time. Uh, but yeah, no, it is it is an ongoing process. Um, and like, friggin' lend us your brain power. If you got it, like, send it our way. <laughs> yeah. we, Use we help. Have, we have time for maybe one, maybe two, if they're really quick uh, questions. Well, what questions do we have? To? All right. Gentleman with the box. How do the uh, 2015 rules relate to mobile networks, and especially zero rating? So this, I'll answer the zero rating question. Um, so mobile networks are interesting because they're also kind of already Title II under the fact that there's cell data. I can't speak specifically to mobile broadband. Um, 
I can say that zero rating is interesting because it is ambiguous under the context of the 2015, and that is an actual debate that consumer advocacy groups have had about whether that's a net neutrality violation or whether that is acceptable. And the rationale behind this is, uh, in fixed broadband, which is, you know, you have an Ethernet jack that comes through the ground off of a fiber line. That's fixed broadband as opposed to cable and DSL. this DSL. thing. Yeah, so cable and DSL or fiber or whatever. Um, in fixed broadband, the only limit really on the amount of data that you can use and that you can receive is functionally, it's a limitation of your hardware. So like, do you have a copper line or a fiber line coming into your home and how much the company decides to give you. So data caps on fixed broadband are completely artificial. Uh, it is literally just Comcast saying, eh, we're gonna give you 50 gigs and then we're gonna nickel and dime you after that point. Uh, mobile broadband, there are actual f problems of physics uh, about how many people are on networks, how many cell sites you can put in a, like what kind of density of cellular towers you can get. And so there are actually like some physical limitations to the amount of data that you can get uh, and that you can reasonably provide to people. Um, and so zero rating on mobile, like there's, there is a very robust debate about whether that's, whether that's like, you know, them nickel and diming you or whether that's like, no, they actually have some limitations on what they can do and like maybe it's a consumer benefit to get some stuff for free as opposed to having to pay for it. Like that's, that's an open question. But one of the nice things that the California State Bill does is it makes very clear what the rules are around paid prioritization and zero rating and saying that you can, you can, you can, you can allow a prioritization for a class of things but not for a specific like edge edge tool that you've created or, or, or anyway or any, for any reason whether it's because you're being paid for it or whatever benefit like you can prioritize a class but not a specific like site or tool. Yeah. All right last question I have to be quick but then if you want to do we'll hang out for a little bit. Actually it probably won't be a quick question so never mind go ahead and close it out it's fine. Okay. Get in the back. We got one we got one in the back who wanted to ask. No you, you need, need the box. No you need the box we're recording. <laughs> it's for the recording. Love the right, box. Fair enough. Box is like. Well, the first one's a quick rhetorical, which is if we have a federal communica communications commission and they're not regulating or they don't have the power to regulate how 90% of people communicate on a daily basis, why do we need them? Uh, but the actual question is I, I hear a lot about um, you know, the internet in general, um, but the way I look at the internet is as the great equalizer. Uh, so if you don't have money to go to school, if you're in a, in a uh, crummy school district, but you can have internet, there's a wealth of information at your fingertips, um, and I see that as closing the gap between uh, privileged and not privileged, and I haven't heard anybody talk about that just yet. So Jessica Rosenworcel, who's one of the commissioners at the FCC, and Mignon Clyburn, who recently left the FCC, who's one of the Democratic commissioners, um, talked a lot about the homework gap, uh, which is specifically what they talk about when, especially in rural areas and other underserved areas, kids need broadband access to do their homework and cannot get it. And so you have kids who literally will go into a McDonald's parking lot and sit there and try to use the free Wi-Fi to do their homework. Um, you know, I think you're totally right in that, like, as a concept, the internet is a great equalizer. I think, you know, with the William Gibson line about the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Um, that internet is, the, is fucking ground zero for not evenly distributed. Um, you know, it's calling it spotty would be generous. Um, and this fight about getting broadband to everybody, you know, what are the conditions you need to set from a regulatory perspective, from frankly a business perspective, because like, let's be real, the way things are written right now, it's gonna be, gonna be Comcast, Verizon, or whatever, actually putting the fiber down. There's debates about whether that should be the case at all. Um, you know, and the, the debate is like, how do we get that? Um, but I think, no, it, the, the homework app and the concept of rural connectivity, uh, the public safety implications of having uh, broadband connectivity in some areas but not others, especially in, in areas that are prone to natural disasters, like the Gulf Coast of Texas, uh, where it is very hard to get broadband in a lot of those places where, you know, you could get hit by a hurricane just any day. Uh, I don't, I've never lived in Texas, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I have an image I get from the news. Uh, I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> um, yeah, no, this is this is absolutely a core part of the debate. Um, and and I'm, I know I'm talking a lot here, but the reason that we as a country got to, I think the status is 97.9% .9 penetration of the telephone network, like the just straight up landline telephone network, is because the government via the FCC made a decision that we wanted to be 100% connected as a nation. 
That was a conscious policy decision. And then the question was, how do we make policies that further that goal? Uh, the FCC currently, especially the current FCC, very much looks at, at broadband as just another consumer product. It's not, they don't see it as an assess. There's a lot of lip service paid to like connecting tribal areas and rural areas, but they do not see this as a, as a critical piece of infrastructure like they did with the telephone system. And so we haven't got policies that flow out of that yet. Uh, and that's a problem. And I can editorialize for another day, but I'll stop there. Okay. That, is, that is all the time that we have. So we're gonna say thank you for sitting through this. Thank you for caring about the issue. Please contact your members of Congress. And if you are interested, please also donate to the cash box in the front of the room. <laughs>